welcome to the Barry Podcast, the unofficial show covering the official HBO hit series, Barry. I am one of your hosts, Jamie G. Esquire, the fifth, master of the truth. And I'm here with my co-host, Magna Mills, to talk about the eighth and final episode of season one of Barry, titled Chapter Eight, Know Your Truth. And, you know, no offense to Paul Pierce, but the truth is, it's too late for the truth. I am Meg Mills, and you are not too late to check out the Barry Podcast. Thank you for checking us out. Find us wherever you get your pods. We're on social media at Barry Podcast. You can search for us on YouTube or find our YouTube channel at JoeBlowFootballShow.com. If you could spare 10 seconds, I know people are busy that day, so I'm only asking for 10 seconds. Please comment, rate, like, follow, subscribe. You know the deal. Just do one of those things. Again, literally takes you less than 10 seconds. If you want to do them all, that's great. But just the one is good because it helps people find our show. And we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. When we cover new episodes of Barry, we spoil everything from all the previous episodes. However, during these rewatch sessions, we will not be spoiling any future events or episodes of Barry. However, at the end of our episode discussion, we will have a full-on spoiler sesh, which is a free-for-all where we discuss any and all spoilers. But don't worry, we'll give you a heads up when we get to that point, so you have plenty of time to go ahead and bounce to Barbados if you so desire. What else? Episode details, good sir. All right, starting now, this is Season 1, Episode 8, Chapter 8. Know Your Truth, originally aired Sunday, May 13th, 2018, with an estimated 548,000 viewers in the United States tuning in live. This is directed by Alec Berg. This is the second episode of Barry that he's directed, written by Alec Berg and Bill Hader. This is their third, written by Credit on Barry. The short plot synopsis is, in the season finale, Barry vows to give up on his life of crime. Elsewhere, Bizarre enlists a replacement to take care of Fuchs. Detective Moss closes in on an arrest that they hope will crack the Madison homicide case. And before we get into our deep recap discussion of this episode, we're going to each give you our overall thoughts here. Remember, no spoilers from beyond this episode. Mills, I thought this was a banger, dude. Um, th- there were some real serious wow moments here, uh, particularly that that final moment. Uh, but but I, I thought that that everything kind of came to a conclusion, but was set up perfectly to roll over and want you, you know, wanting more as, as season two. So um, I'm not sure on the deets on if they had already renewed for season two by the time this aired or not, but um, this, this one made me want season two. I think this was actually better than I remember it being honestly. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. And I believe the first time I watched Barry was I caught up on season one right as season two was going to come out. So I like finished this episode and then I had to wait, I don't know, either like eight hours or a day or two days. It wasn't long for oh. the next episode. So that worked out for me. But yeah, I mean, this is great writing, the way they kind of bring it all back around here. I mean, like everything works for me. Like even the idea of bringing in Ruslan as like the, the twin brother for uh, Vodka or whatever, it all works. Even Barry taking him out. So much of the writing comes back around like that idea because he crouches, makes him think it could be a short person. So it's the Bolivians in the idea that Chance couldn't find the Facebook and the Barry Block thing that Ryan was the one who suggested the name. Yeah, I mean, just I think phenomenal writing overall. Really enjoyed it. Thought they closed the season on a high note and, you know, made me desperately excited to see like, well, what do they do next? One hundo, my dude. All right, man. I don't know about your truth, but I do know that it's time to start breaking down this fine, fine episode. I guess that's what we do next. And we open the episode in Fuchs's hotel room. There's a the sound of a key in the card lock, and it wakes him up. Fuchs yells that he's got a gun, and he's pleasantly surprised when Barry enters the room. Barry basically ignores Fuchs and empties the money from the false bottom suitcase. When Fuchs protests, Barry punches him in the face twice and tells Fuchs that he's done. Starting now starting now hey, i like that if he's like you can't just come here fucking hit me in the face and barry responds oh. like, just socks him again dude oh dude dude these punches all right you, you, you we're not doing them justice like they were epic punches dude like they were straight up like they were some of the best right hooks i've seen in a long time man i mean long time well, it's because Fuchs, or too, because Barry knew too, like Fuchs isn't going to dodge or block or anything. Like he's just basically a dead target. Like that's how he Fuchs is. He's the, the mouth guy. 
he doesn't do like the physical shit. He gets other people to, you know, do his work for him more or less. That's who he is. And it really looked like uh, you talked about the uh, the empty bottle of uh, bourbon or whatever last episode. It looks like he did finish that off and just passed Push out off that right, right in that chair. So he hasn't basically moved from that chair since we last saw him. And just so we know, too, Blanton's, you know, it can range. If you live in a state where the state controls alcohol cost, it can, you know, it can be anywhere from 60 to, to $85. If you live in a state where, you know, liquor sales are privatized and anyone can have a liquor store, shit, dude, sometimes it's 150 to 200 plus for a bottle of Blanton. So uh, it's an expensive bottle of bourbon. And, you know, they have the little horse race guys on top. There's seven of them. Spells out Blanton's. Everyone wants to kind of get one of the horses. So uh, it's a thing amongst bourbon heads. But shout out for Fuchs or just pounding that thing i like mine with just not necessarily neat i like mine with just a smidge of ice but hey blends is blends i mean that sounded like an elevator pitch to me we'll have to talk about that possible business opportunity later i do think they did a nice job of setting up fuchs's tooth here it gets loosened by barry we eventually uh, see it get knocked out later and then bagged as evidence so again great writing yeah and uh, speaking of gordon's garage after the title card fuchs heads over to gordon's garage Goran is furious with Fuchs, so Fuchs plays the only card he has left. He tells Goran that Barry is alive. Unfortunately for Fuchs, the Chechens already know about the acting class, thanks to Vacha. Fuchs tells them that Barry turned on him, but Goran doesn't care. He has one of his guys finish what Barry started, and the guy punches Fuchs in the face and knocks his loose tooth out. Goran has Fuchs zip-tied to a chair, I guess I couldn't find the bike lock, and introduces him to Ruslan, Vacha's twin brother. Goran tells Ruslan to kill Fuchs and cut him into manageable pieces. Fuchs tries to talk to Ruslan like he talks to Vacha, but he gets nowhere fast. Uh, I mean, was this Fuchs' only move to go to the Chechens? Or should he have just left town? I mean... Well, it's not his only move, but I think it shows that Fuchs feels slighted by Barry here. And I, I think it's kind of one of those things like a like a terrible relationship where like you can break up with me, but you can never leave me. Like, you know what I mean? Like I think Fuchs is just not going to let Barry go. And I think he's going to do, you know, whatever it takes to kind of save his face and get even. So I, I think that's, you're starting to see a little bit more kind of developing for Fuchs here in terms of how he, you know, he Fuchs is all about Fuchs, man. Did you just like compare Fuchs to the hotel California? Like you can never leave. I mean, that's what it's like. You can like. stay, it, but you can never leave. That's, that's uh you know, and, you have to give him credit, right? He had many balls to come there. He did have many balls. <laughs> you have many balls. Shout out, Goran, dude. Oh, and everything you. in this scene just just sings for me, really. Uh, and again, you see Hank offering, again, the submarine sandwich. Like, you know, hey, can I get you anything? And maybe a steak for your face. That's maybe like one of, like for Hank. That qualifies as like a level four burn unit when he says that to Fuchs because he's got the, from where Barry hit him, like maybe a steak for your face. This is this is kind of twice this season we've seen Fuchs beat the shit up, just show up, dude. He he's not wiping off blood, he's not doing anything. He's just he's just going with it, and I I think that's great. And yeah, dude, I want a submarine sandwich from from NoHo Hank. Like I'm curious to see what's on it. It's probably like Lunchables and like a hot dog bun or something. But yeah, it, I would love to know what's on it. There's just so much. I mean, I'm, this is either going to be in some combination my favorite moment or scene. There's going to be something in this whole bit especially like when fuchs walks through it's kind of a mirror of the uh pilot episode where barry walks through and remember it's like kids watching the tv or whatever here in the same right. room it's just a bunch of dudes all with guns because of the possible a uh, war with the chechens and then just watching goran on the treadmill he's like in regular clothes on the treadmill smoking a cigar it's just i Dude, i just i it's with so the best i mean the best short sleeve sweater that zips all the way from start to finish with zipper pockets. Like this thing is a work of art, dude. It's a work of art. This I want that rack. sweater. You can't buy it off the rack, dude. It's custom. That's no way. Annoying. That's custom. Like best chats consignment. You got to like have somebody who's going to go look. And then the introduction of Ruslan, dude. And the idea, like it, it freaks Fuchs out because he's the one who tried to like file his teeth. File his teeth. Two down. of them. And then kind of the way Gordon's like, Ruslan here was last van born. So he got a little overcooked. He is really crazy, man. <laughs> and then the subtitle, 
of when they're talking about like what to do with Fuchs and like to chop him up into pieces. And then sometimes, you know, where Goran's like, uh, no one likes lugging around 50 kilos of torso. And Hank says, that is back injury waiting to happen. Yes, dude. It's, it's, yeah, I mean, it casual. is. I mean, I'm not saying it's wrong. But, well, uh, it, no, he's not. He's wrong. He's absolutely right. But their casual Chechkin conversation, just how they place words with the subtitles, it, dude, that's as golden as, is anything the show has done, and the show's done a lot of golden shit. You know, especially like when Fuchs is trying to like pitch at the Goran, he gets mad, so like he just turns up the treadmill speed, and he just yeah, he starts power walking, dude. Uh, everything about the scene is just again, like it's just absolutely fantastic. Goran's garage, bro. It's never let us down. It really isn't, and it feels like something that would be on PBS, but you probably couldn't put this one on PBS. After that, they all go inside and Goran tells Hank and the guys that they're going to go to the acting class after Ruslan finishes with Fuchs. Hank tries to dissuade Goran from going to the acting class, and Goran confronts Hank about where his loyalties lie. Hank swears that he does not love Barry and that he's loyal to Goran. Nevertheless, Goran tells Hank to stay there and help with the dishes instead of going to the acting class with the rest of them. I mean, Jamie G is like, you know, Hank claims here he's just being polite. Is he just being polite or is it more complex than that? I think it might be a smidge more complex than that, but he is very, very, very polite. Yeah, you cannot doubt his politeness. Like, uh, I mean, is it really that bad to offer everyone a submarine sandwich? That's such a weird ask. Like, I mean, maybe that's like uh, the invitation, right? Like, no one's actually going to take you up on it, so you don't have to really worry. I mean, really, Goran does have a point here that, uh, you know, Hank did plant the lips to camera and get shot by Barry, and now he's sticking up for Barry. And maybe he's the only one who really thinks that that Barry's a good guy. But I never really got the impression that he was in love with Barry. Just that, like, I don't know, he kind of, like, felt like Barry was a kindred spirit or something like that, you know. And uh, shout out the Space Jam joke, just that Hank sets it up here with... Uh, you know the song Fly Like an Eagle, performed by Seal on the Space Jam soundtrack? If I embody, I fly like an eagle. And that's what sets, like, and that's what sets going off, too. Is like that particular thing is like it's so Are you in love with Barry? Yeah, like that just sent them off. Like, oh, he's willing to like go there. Like, uh, dude, th- again, anytime we get the Chechkins here, it's it's just proved to be fantastic. And you know what? I applaud the show because you know, going going through kind of this being the eighth and final episode of season one, they didn't overuse them. If anything, I think they could have used them more, but I think they were really smart and strategic about how they use the Chechkins. It's been perfect. Yes, absolutely that. And we're not done with him because after that, we see that Barry is sitting on a beach and he gets a call from Noho Hank. Hank tells him that Fuchs there at Goran's, but Barry probably won't be seeing him again. He also lets Barry know that Goran is going to go to the acting class. Hank has to go, and Barry contemplates his next move. He gets in his car, and he drives away. I think what's interesting here is like right after we heard Hank swear loyalty, he to Goran, he immediately betrays him, right? Do you think Hank was really bullshitting, or do you think like he doesn't count this as like a pure betrayal in his mind because Barry isn't really like, you know, coming after them, I guess? I I, th- I think it's kind of maybe. I also think Hank more complex felt, than that. <laughs> I think it's more complex than that. I think Hank felt put down. You know, poor Hank's been like a little bit of a yo yo where he's at times he's been you know, beaten to shit. And then at other times been propped up. And remember he's coming on the heels here of feeling kind of reinvigorated by, by crystal ball complimenting, sending the, the bullet DHL. I mean, that was a big deal for him. And then he gets ripped open. You know, he kind of clearly over the last couple episodes became the number two to Goran here, you know, after being bounced down from Fuchs, then he came back and now he's bounced down again. I think he just, I think he just kind of had it up to here a little bit. Wanted to save Barry. I think he respects Barry. I think respects Barry is key. And like, again, maybe he sees kind of Barry is trying to be like an up and comer like him or whatever, but you do get the, the payoff of the space jam line here. So I suggest you take our money and, you know, fly like bug bunny in space jam. I don't know who pitched this in the writer's room, but I'm, I'm there for your space jam jokes. Uh, if you, if you want to make a couple on the LeBron space jam in the final season, I will be there for it. But next, what we're here for is the LAPD, because we're back there, and we see Janice tell Loach that they've got a warrant for Goran Pizar's arrest. 
we go back to Goran's garage, and we see that Ruslan has the skill saw going, but he's not chopping Fuchs up. Instead, he's making Fuchs watch as he builds stocks to hold Fuchs. He's got, he got the plans from a woodworking magazine. Ruslan explains that watching him build this shit is part of the torture. Goran tells him to stop with the theatrics and just kill Fuchs, but Ruslan refuses. Goran grabs a gun and prepares to show Ruslan how they get rid of someone in America. We hear a gunshot, but Fuchs is okay. Instead, we see that Goran has been shot in the head. The rest of the Chechens are also shot by Barry, who's come to rescue Fuchs. Barry releases him, but they leave before Fuchs can retrieve his tooth. He wanted to. I'll give I'll give Fuchs credit. He wanted to go back in for that tooth, but Barry, see, Fuchs Barry probably wanted to try to put it back in his mouth, though not actually for evidentiary purposes. Would be my oh guess. yeah, he just didn't want to not have a tooth. Like yeah, you got to put that in like a you know a cup of milk or whatever you're supposed to do. I forget the thing. Uh, I mean, let's let's break down the most important thing here. Like, what do you think about Ruslan's torture technique with the building of the stocks? I mean, he had a plan, right? Give, give the man that he had a plan. He definitely had a plan, and and I admit that. If I was in the position of the the person about to be tortured, watching him build this would be a form of torture for sure. Like he's not totally he's wrong. He's not wrong. He's not wrong, but he had some solid craftsmanship. You know, he he did have the half circle perfectly drawn out. You know, we had more than one saw because you can't make a circle. You know, he had to have a circular saw in there too. So, yes, we did not see like there were saw horses. There was there were other uh, materials. We didn't see where the lumber came from. You, you know, apparently Goran had it laying around. It's, you know, it, obviously if he would have asked. But I don't want to think too much about this because I just love every single thing about it. And just the idea, and Goran getting frustrated, he's finally like, just kill him. And at that point, Ruslan's like, no. Like he pro- whips out the picture of Vacha, which is really just a picture of himself. And he's just like, no, dude. Like I am, I'm drawing the fucking line here. And then the idea that even like they're so similar when he was first going to think about doing it, he grabbed the hockey mask. And that's where Gordon finally like grabs the hockey mask because that's what Vachi used to do with the creepy hockey mask. And just like, all right, dude, like, enough of the theatrics. And then, yeah, dude, Gordon getting a headshot. Like it was hard to tell where it came from at first. And then the idea, like he's just waving the gun around like uncontrollably and everyone kind of just dodging it. I thought it was just a, an incredible visual. And I laughed my ass off. Dude, huge chunk out of his side of his head. Tons of blood. Yes. And he just sits down in the, what I love about it is he just sits down in the little, his like little daughter's chair. <laughs> yeah. Waving in the arms was wild. Cause everyone was like, Oh my God, he's going to shoot us or not. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely cool. Well, after that, the LAPD is on their way to Gore's to serve their warrant and they're rocking out to flight of the bumblebee because Loesch cannot burn a CD. Apocalypse now, motherfucker. What the fuck is this? That's Flight of the Bumblebee. Apocalypse Now is Bride of the Valkyries, you idiot. Back at Gorin's, Hank discovers the bodies in the garage. Hearing the sirens approaching, Hank tells the remaining guys that they have to get out of there. Bear gives Fuchs all of the money and forces him out of his car at the airport. Barry tells Fuchs that he's done with him. He's done with all of this, starting right now. And let's be honest here. I know they don't give us an exact time frame when the show takes place, but at this point, people have smartphones, iPods, iPads, what have you. Is Fuchs the last man alive burning CDs? He has to be, right? I mean, he, not is, Fuchs, especially Loesch. for this occasion. Yes, is Loesch, excuse me, is Loesch the last man alive who still burns CDs? Like, I don't even know if they sell CD burners anymore. Dude, I haven't had a car that had a CD the ability to play CDs <laughs> in a minute, dude. Like, I mean, to your point, they have smartphones, like everything's pretty much streamed, but I think that's what adds to the humor of this is the fact that he made a mix. A burnt oh, it's hundred percent deliberate. And then the idea that he fucks it up with flight of the bumblebee instead of ride of the Valkyries is just absolutely fantastic. And the look that kind of Janice gives him, like, you know what I mean? Like you get to India, like she always tries to like, not you know like even though she was running the betting pool or whatever i think like she doesn't really necessarily like want to hate on loche and this is just why like she's like dude come on man you do it to yourself like this is too easy and i want to shout out uh hank uh, anthony corgan the actor here like kind of the, the acting when he comes out with the uh the tray we saw of the uh, the nice china for the tea and he brings it out to the garage and he kind of sees the bodies and you just kind of see 
all of the various emotions cross his face. Like first he's surprised, then he's a little sad, and then he's maybe like not so sad given kind of the last conversation he had with Goran or whatever. And I, and then kind of like and he, you see him actually thinking about the guys or I don't know, man. I thought uh you know at, at that moment Hank was thinking about like maybe you know maybe I got to step up, maybe you know what happens next. And he immediately knew it was Barry too. Like he immediately knew body. Who I mean, yeah, only only body could do that. Yeah, I mean, not a uh, not uh, Sacha. Like, remember how long ago, like when like they had like Ace Assassin. Like, uh, apparently, all of the uh, Ace Assassins and tortured people of the Chechens are dead now. So, probably gonna need Barry because back at Gorn's garage, the LAPD is breaking down the crime scene, and we see somebody put Fuchs's tooth in an evidence bag. Janice and Loach enter the garage, and Janice immediately thinks that the Bolivians did this, but Loach isn't so sure. Why would she jump to conclusions? A crime scene tech suggests that the shooter was very short, and that seals the deal for Janice and Loach. The police hold a press conference where they declare that Ryan worked with Taylor to pit the Chechens and the Bolivians against each other. I guess the main thing here, like, A, kind of they bring the, uh, you know, whatever, the, the Bolivians are short joke back around. But really, is Janice so quick to blame the Bolivians because she wants to get this over with, she thinks they did it, or because she just wants an excuse to uh, go back to Gene? Maybe a little column A, a little column B. You know, she's she's shown some restraint. She got burned that one time, right? Uh back a couple episodes ago. But I think a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. She she wants that that mean gene, dude. And uh on top of it all, do you think that Barry intentionally crouched like to make it look like a Bolivian, or probably just the fact like to get the proper angle he had to crouch and it just worked out that way because the crime scene text like neutral it's like shooter was either crouching or he was extremely short like it wasn't like you know a definitive one way or the other crouching so that people didn't see him i, I think it just happened to work out that way and it's just a it's just another kind of backhanded slight against bolivian people which which is something that the show's it's been a runner this whole season so yeah it definitely has and uh you know shout out we see the uh the chief there in the press conference, and we also see Noho Hank. He's watching the press conference at the stash house with Cristobal. He's, he's invited him there for a sit down. They've hit it off, and the plan seems to be for the Bolivians and the Chechens to work together going forward. Back at the press conference, Janice gets a call from Jean. He tells her that she looks great, and since she's cracked the case, she owes him a swift kick in the balls. Couple things here. Shout out to Jean's outfit again we talk about it a lot but this time he's got the he's got the long sleeve shirt with the open buttons with the tie-dye underneath like gene looks incredible here gene's got gear you gotta give that gene's got gear and again they keep it going here where we see hank offer cristobal a submarine sandwich no one ever like is it a hoagie yo i mean you do look around and see that you know hank did try to do it right they got a proper spread they got some beers they got some stuff and yeah, uh, Gene's look absolutely perfect. And I just love the idea, like Gene's watching the press conference on TV and everybody is facing forward except Janice and she's just turned off to the side talking to Gene. I just love that visual. I thought that was uh, really cool. And uh, yeah, they have a really, you know, again, don't want to shame or whatever, but they do have a very interesting relationship. Yes. Yeah, to say the least. And we see at residuals, the acting class is also watching the press conference when Barry walks in. Sally greets him warmly with a hug, which catches Barry off guard. Barry explains to her that he's going to quit the class. Sally sits him down and finally tells Barry her origin story, so to speak. She was married right out of high school and her ex-husband abused her. Nobody knows except, well, Jean and Natalie and, oh, okay, maybe a few people know. But that's not the point. The point is, she draws on that experience when she's acting, which is why she knows that Barry was doing something similar. She tells Barry that she wants to do a play with him, and he agrees. The camera zooms out, and the screen fades to black. And I love the little touch here when they're talking, like as the press conference is going on, you see like the bartender or whatever take a... Ryan's plaque down that they put up in I think the second or third episode or whatever there to like you know in a memorandum or whatever and now like after that he's like oh no we gotta take this plaque down you know you're in trouble when a bar takes your picture down yeah dude and it's so and it's just subtly being done where only Barry sees it too which is just kind of like his peripheral very it's a little like 
subtle thing, but it's hilarious. And another thing that's kind of subtle but hilarious is uh, when Sally starts talking about the play they're going to do, and she says, Don't worry, you don't have to get too heavy. It's not a drama, it's a comedy, so all you have to do is talk really loud and fast. Anyone can do it. I think, A, that's a meta commentary there, and the way Sarah Goldberg delivers it is very loud and fast. I, I think just a very nice touch there. And I don't know, man, do you think that Barry sticks around for the acting thing or just because he's strictly into Sally? Like, what if he, even if Sally didn't want to do the play, would if he just stuck around if Sally said, you want to go out with me? Yes. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think yeah. I agree with you. So I don't think it's I I don't know that this one is more complex than that. No, I don't think so. We fade back from the black and see Barry and Sally rehearsing while laying together in a hammock. Some time has obviously passed, and they are now a couple. They're at Jean's lake house, and they observe Janice arriving. Barry does have to get up and help her with her bags. Barry and Sally greet her with hugs, so we probably know that they've been hanging out previously. Jean invites everyone inside, and we see the poster for Barry and Sally's upcoming play. Janice notes that Barry is listed as Barry Block, not Barry Berkman. Uh, dude, if you had to guess, how much time do you think went by here? You know, it honestly, it looks like Barry's hair is slightly longer. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say maybe three to six months. Uh, six months is about where I was at. Like, cause it wasn't nothing, right? But it's kind of hard to tell with the seasons in California or whatever. And again, a little maybe not like super consistent. Like, were you surprised that Gene has like a lake house? A little bit. Yeah. I, I mean, I, it kind of it kind of surprised me a little bit. Like, wow, okay, that's where they are. Especially at first, because it kind of looked like maybe you know Barry kind of bought it and just moved there, right, with with Sally or something. And so I thought it was kind of interesting to to learn that it was that it was Jeans and that Janice was coming for the weekend or whatever. Yeah, and they do make a point to like like oh high speed internet, like it's a little obvious. Whatever, someone like that's a a writer's thing or whatever but i did really like that a when they're talking about the poster gene's like oh yeah we just decided that font picking a font is hard if you never had to really actually decide between fonts not the easiest thing in the world and then uh you know janice finally notices that it's it's not barry berkman it's barry block and she says but barry block and barry says uh that's my stage name yeah it's catchier than berkman and janice is like oh is it Dude, Janice gets some of the best subtle burns. Like, that's just like, oh, is it? Like, that should, like, really kind of rock him to the core. And uh, honestly, uh, Barry Berkman is pretty good. Like, it already has the alliteration and everything. He didn't really need it to be Barry Block. Yeah, I don't know that she's wrong here, right? I think that she's I think that she's correct in that. Is it really, though? And that's something that comes up in a, you know, in about a minute here, well, you know, give or take, is that, dude, don't, like, both Barry and Janice just seem really happy here. Yeah. Compared to especially where we've seen them through the rest. Like, obviously, I think everybody is very happy here. Like, it's, you know, about as happy as we ever see all of them. But I think especially because, you know, Janice basically, even when she was kind of w- getting with Gene, didn't really seem like happy, happy. And Barry had never been like happy, happy, except in his imagination. So I think they do a good job here of really setting up like, you know, everyone is like riding really high right now. And they're riding out so high that we see Gene rocking out to some Jamaica town. He's grilling some steaks and legitimately both couples seem to be having the time of their lives. Over dinner, they talk about Barry and Sally's next play and their career plans. Barry wants to stick to the theater while Sally has been generating buzz around town in recent auditions for movies and TV. Gene tells the story about Barry giving him a monologue about being a hitman, which we saw back in the pilot episode. Barry kind of claims not to remember, but given the way Janice looks at him, the damage has been done. Janice switches the subject and talks about Sally doing a ride-along, while Barry stares at her apprehensively. I mean, this is Barry, right? Everything was just going way too well. He was so happy. He had everything he ever wanted in life. He had a community. And now it's like, oh, and he knew it too. As soon as that started coming out, he knew it. Were you a little bit su- surprised that he didn't, you know, kind of trace his steps here a little bit uh, to cover knowing how close Janice could be to his to his situation? Or are you I mean, I guess deleting his Facebook page or just removing Chris as a friend. Uh, Barry, but again, I don't even my guess is he doesn't even know the password to his own Facebook page. Sally set it up. Eh. 
Well, there was posts and stuff on there. That's why it's like he, you know, he was. Uh, I just assumed he was tagged in them or something. I honestly don't remember how Facebook works. It's been over a decade for me for what, you know, whatever doing. Do you get a chip? Like, what do they give you when you've been off Facebook for a decade? In, uh, you know, I, we're still kind of juvenile on some level. So I, I like the idea that when they were talking about the play that they were going to do next, and uh, Barry was talking about, oh, yeah, we're going to switch parts every night, like the crazy person, the straight person, or whatever. And Janice was like, So you, you're expecting people to come multiple times? That is what she said. I mean, I'm expecting multiples on this one. So, but, but how hilarious is that? That right away, Sally was like, Yeah. And Barry was like, Oh, like that never like dawned on him. <laughs> Really, they should have said from an acting standpoint, that's fun. I'm sure that actually does happen. Oh, and we did that in like high school videos. I remember like switching the roles halfway through, like just switch clothes and like just do a rough cut. And uh, that was a good time. That brings us to the final scene of the season. Later that evening, Janice grabs her laptop and heads outside. She sits out on the dock and logs into Facebook. She finds Barry's page by searching for Barry Block and she sees pictures of him, Chris, and Taylor. Barry appears behind her with his hands up, and he asks her to just forget what she's seen. He's a good person, and he did what he had to do to put all of that behind him. He tries everything he can think of to get her not to do this, but she refuses. Barry backs up, and we see that he stashed a gun hanging from a tree. He asks her one more time not to do this, and she says, it's done. The camera cuts to Sally in bed, and we hear muffled gunshots outside. Later, as the sun comes up, Barry sneaks back into bed next to Sally. He looks up at the ceiling and whispers, starting now. And again, they probably burned the starting now as a title too early. I, I My guess is, like, if you did a bingo card, maybe they said the title of every episode of the season in this episode. This was a, this was an ending, right? I mean, I guess the, the main thing here, like, Barry kind of says, like, him and Janice are the same. And you get the idea that neither were happy before and they were both happy here. So you think on some level they are the same. I mean, Janice is basically, you know, like I have morals and principles. I'm a cop. You're a murderer. You do get the idea that Barry thinks he has principles. But again, a lot of, you know, villains are probably the hero of their own story. I think Barry truly believes that he's a good person who got who got forced into something that he didn't know how to do and taken advantage of. And maybe there's some truth to that, but he still did it. And, you know, he got caught up in it and he still did it. So it's like, yes, you know, I think there's some truth to that in his lie. But I also think that Janice for a second realized the the implication here, right? If she goes through with this, it is going to set off absolute thunderclaps amongst everything that, that she is involved in in terms of her own personal happiness with Jean and Sally and everything. And you can see her almost tearing up at a certain point as she's coming to conclusions with the fact that despite all that, she still has to move forward with it. It was a very powerful scene and outstanding acting by both Janice and Hayter. And I guess that's kind of the thing, right? Like if you look back at Chris, like he really, I guess, legitimately wanted to do the good thing and tried to, and that's what cost him his life. And the same thing happens to Janice here. And while Barry's claiming to be that good person, he still, A, brought a gun with him to the lake house, and then B, went out there and set this up knowing what could possibly happen. That's not really a, the thing a good person would do, right? Like, if he'd really changed, he would have stepped up and taken punishment for his crimes or whatever. Just saying. I mean, that would have been the end of the show, and it would have been a hell of a one-season series. But despite, but you know, despite finally getting his happiness, I guess it's, I guess it's better to have it for a day than for never. Right, you know? like he kind of like thinks about Sally being back in bed and like you know what could happen to her career and that kind of thing, and like actually thinks about other people. But that's been one thing that's pretty consistent with Barry is he never really considers the consequences to anybody except himself, or he just can't, or he's unca- incapable of doing so. Right. Yeah, and again, you know, starting now the Facebook thing. Everything comes back around just extremely, you know, just one of the, you know, best uh, first seasons of television as far as a, a writing standpoint and just how tight it is. There's really, you know, again, you can kind of have a couple of minor quibbles here or whatever, but just an absolutely phenomenally well-written first season of television or season of television overall. 
Yeah, com completely agree. And that is the end of our recap. And before we hand out our, our awards here, let's see what the other people that, you know, grade these type of things. Let's see what they thought about the episode. Over on IMDb, Chapter 8, Know Your Truth, has a rating of 8.9. That makes it the eighth highest rated episode of Barry out of 24 total episodes. It also puts it in the top third uh, of episodes. You know, I will note that that is slightly down. IMDb had the the, the penultimate episode, Chapter 7, rated at 9.2, so down a bit from there. Mills, I mean, do you think this is in the top third of, of Barry episodes here? And again, remember, please no spoilers moving forward. Easiest thing I can say is I almost consider 7 and 8 to be in part and parcel, like two parts of the same episode or whatever. So I would grade them very closely. So I would say this is easily a top eight episode and probably right up there with the previous episode. So, you know, I would put both of them between four and eight, somewhere in that range, probably. So yes, pretty easily a top eight. Uh, how about yourself? Look, dude, I, th I think this is a fantastic episode. I'm actually higher on it, I think, than uh, than IMDb is so you know we'll give our ratings in a minute but yeah it's hard, it's hard to argue that man which is really crazy because you think there's only 24 of these man and there's really not a bad episode of Barry even some of the early ones when they're when they're figuring it out it's not bad it's just the, the standards really I mean it's Mike Tomlin would say the standard is a standard I mean it's it's high here so now this isn't James Cameron on South Park man the bar is very high and we know that everybody on the show works hard to set the bar high like that but bill Hader himself has admitted that they don't necessarily spend a ton of time on episode titles uh i don't think that know your truth is necessarily one of the best episode titles so jamie g what do you think can you uh do a little bit better than that I mean, come on dude a submarine sandwich would have been so killer dude i mean it, like i know it got used a couple of times but that would have been a great one yeah, I think there's, I have, three, well, I have many takes, but I would say uh, the the if I had actually pitched in the room, I would say it gets easier, trust me, would fit pretty well thematically with the episode. And if you want to do a little bit of a parody thing, how to get rid of somebody in America, and, it, you know, I think also fits with the way the episode ends. But if you were just going to have fun, there's like three options, the, uh, Honorable mention to a steak for your face. Honorable mention to 50 kilos of torso, but really beat stocks on a plane. Like I want to <laughs> see Ruslan. I just want to see fuck putting snakes on a plane. I want to see Ruslan trying to like bring stocks on a plane. I mean, how can you bring stocks on a plane? Ruslan, show us how. If anyone could do it, I feel like it would be him. Uh, but that's that's classic, dude. That's that's stocks on a plane would be great. A steak for your face would be would be very good too. And I think that would kind of fit a little bit with how, how they've kind of done them. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's way up there for me. All right. So what do you think? Do you want to, I'll give you two choices. You can either spell Yo Jimbo, or you can start handing out the episode awards. Your choice. I think I'm going to move on to handing out the awards. It is time for us to hand out the awards for episode eight. We'll start by each choosing our favorite quotes or dialogue exchange from the episode mills. In an episode that seemed like there was a never-ending amount of things to choose from, I mean, the, the dialogue here was just so good. Whether you want comedy, whether you want serious, whether you want kind of deep meaning of it all, it was all there for you, dude. I've just, I've just got to go back to, I, I want to do the Space Jam thing, but I'm not going to, even though that's hilarious. I'm going to go on the, on the deep tip here, dude, and I'm going to go with Barry at the end with with janice where he's really trying to convince her and we want the same thing we we want to be happy we want love we want a life and we're doing it janice we're the same but we're not we're not the same, Barry. Because I'm a cop. And you're a fucking murderer. It's one of those things where it's like, that is all that Barry wants. But I don't know that they're the same. And there lies the problem. 
therein does lie the problem. And one thing I can tell you I did not have a fucking problem with is the scene between Loach and Janice in the car when Loach has burned his CD. He's ready to go. He's got this apocalypse now shit. He puts it in and he's like the fuck is this? That's Flight of the Bumblebee. Apocalypse Now is Bride of the Valkyries, you idiot. I love you, Loach. Like, just the uh, maybe you've overtaken tech, sort, uh, tech support guy, too, is my favorite supporting character as far as the more minor guys we don't see a lot, but I loved it. And next up, I want to talk about my favorite scene. The thing I love the most to watch, scene, moment, what have you, from Chapter 8, Know Your Truth. It's my turn to go first. And again, there's a couple of good ones here, but for me, it's hand down. The introduction of Ruslan. I love everything about this. They bring him in. Fuchs freaks the fuck out because he thinks it's Vacha. And then Gorn calls him kind of overcooked and grabs him. And he's kind of like dumb. And uh, every part of this, easy peasy, lemon squeezy, top of the charts from B, Jamie G, favorite scene, moment, or what have you from uh, chapter eight here. A lot of great ones, but I'm also going to stay in Goran's garage. And I, I got to go with with Fuchs showing up. And and I got to go with just Goran being, you know, just from the entry all the way in to when he finally gets into the garage with Goran. And, and you know, Goran tells him, you have you have many balls to come here. I mean, that's just – this whole scene was fantastic, dude. It's It was pure gold, and I could have watched that over. It's over so there. good because basically we took – I took the end of that scene. You took the beginning of it, and we both took yes. the middle – because that's, that's how good that's that how you know it's, it's very good like yes absolutely top of the charts my guess is if we were like doing a season one like top five scenes or moments i would be in both of our top fives for the entire season so make it that yeah, one too. I, I think so too and maybe we will do that we'll see that brings us to our greek freak of assassins which is our mvp of this episode man tough one to go first here but i want i know i keep going back to the mill but I'm going to have to go Barry again. And it's because he got what he wanted. Look at how good his life was. And then he ended up doing one thing and he gets to seemingly retain that life. We'll see if it all falls apart heading into season two, but given where he is, given all the stuff that he does, it looks like he got away with it and he's got his life here. Yeah. It does feel like he could be on the Kanye, like the all falls down, both the song and the uh, career plot, but there's no reason to think that at this point for me there was one clear mvp he doesn't make it out alive but i don't give a fuck because he stood up for what he believed in to do what he thought his brother would have wanted that's fucking ruslan dude he comes in he is strong he stands up to his principles he's also very good at woodworking so he'd be useful to have around uh everything about ruslan and just the idea that like the vacha shot up the actor here just 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 chef's kiss just uh absolutely beautiful and you know who's absolutely beautiful henry winkler because i'm the fonz huh? <laughs> and we're not karate tees we're not the oscars we, you know we can only just do our best to grade the episode chapter eight know your truth and in honor of that beautiful man henry winkler gene kusanow himself we grade each episode of Barry on a scale of 1 to 10. Fonzies. Hey. I am up first here. You did the thing first on the MVP. And I said that I compared this episode very favorably to episode 7. So I'm going to stick with the same grade. 9.2. I feel like this, you know, is almost a, uh, you know, one long episode. It, it does jump a little bit, obviously, in the, the back half of the second one here in the episode 8. But I think 9.2 very strong i think seven and eight are by far the strongest parts of the season but they couldn't have been that strong without everything that led up to it that's what foreplay is uh jamie g it's name with the foreplay just give me the grade ski Some oh man you know you know i hate to skip the foreplay because it's just so very foreplay important. is generally mandatory I'm, I'm 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 giving you a pass here like thank you play, i guess so. i'll you know i guess i'll just get right you to gotta it. get the card like the anniversary card like you one uh one skip foreplay please I'm uh I'm I'm going just one little smidge of a A up from that. And I, you know, I graded episode seven at 9.2. I'm giving this 9.3. And look, man, when when we're in it's rare air where we are. So while we're up here in this rare air, a, a point one, people might be like, ah, oh, what's the difference? 9.2 and 9.3. It's a big deal. 
All right, that's a whole nother A. But on top of that, I, I put this one just a little bit over episode seven. Um, I thought there was a little bit more comedy. We got a little bit more of the Chechkins. Dude, that final scene was like absolutely epic. I just, I got, I got to give it up here for, for, for what they did with this man. 9.3 A's. Yeah, I know how you're doing. You're doing a little bit louder now, a little bit louder now, a little bit louder now. Like you just want to eventually shout. And you know what? We want to shout because it's time for the spoiler section. So if you do not want to hear us shout about spoilers or shout yourself about spoilers, whatever, anything from future episodes here could be up in the air. So if that's not anything you are interested in or want to hear, please go ahead, check out now. Thanks again for tuning in. Make sure again, do the comment like rate follow subscribe thing check back for our next episode which will cover the show must go on probably that's a season two premiere and for everybody else here is our spoiler discussion starting now but dude pretty important tooth right like that very does, important uh, come come that definitely comes back around yeah, and look, they they took the time to set it up, and they set it up in a hilarious fashion. Worked really well, and they showed, you know, kind of you kind of got three three swings of the tooth here, right? The first time Fuchs gets punched, when he actually you know drops it out, and then when he wants to go back and get it, and then of course actually four strikes, and then when you see the 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 police kind of pick it up, so there there were four mentions of it, if you will. So yeah, it's a pretty big deal. Ends up uh, ends up coming back to haunt him. And dude. You can't not mention this is the first time at the press conference we meet the big cat, the chief, yo, Mr. Big Cat himself, going to be head of the task force eventually. And he's right there, and he's the one who does the Yojimbo and everything. It's so great, and it's so subtle. I love that they brought him back and made him, you know, kind of like, I shouldn't say crucial, but basically you know, maybe the main source of comic relief within the LAPD or whatever, and maybe like the funniest non-Chechen or non-Hank, you know, portion of the show, at least in season three. So uh, shout out Big Cat. Uh, very excited to see him uh, introduced here. Yeah, yeah, a little, little, just enough to kind of get it, get it going for you, dude. But, you know, when you're watching it for the first time, no idea, you have, you have no idea what's coming with the world of Big Cat. So uh, nice to uh, to see that come to fruition. He's got a logo game like you wouldn't believe. I mean, this dude can pick logos. He can't make yes, logos, he but he can pick logos. Yes, he can. And I think, you know, I think this is the first meeting between Hank and Cristobal, right? So we've got that for sure. They seem to be getting along just swell. Uh, this is nice. It is nice. And I just got to say, dude, the, the the fact that they hired literally the shortest people they could find it just drives it home again as the chechkin workers are trying to interact you know he's telling them hank's telling them to go mingle it just just it's the little things with this one man yeah and i i, I do really i'm still interested in that stash house it basically seems to just be like a costco or something that they took over they have a little bit of everything including all these random extra tvs and yeah i mean you know obviously hank and cristobal are going to be a thing and the one thing, I don't think it's quite the same, but the shot of Barry when he's kind of sitting on the beach reminded me a lot of those shots in season three where he's kind of hallucinating or whatever towards the end. It's kind of that dark beach. I don't know that it's necessarily the same one, but I certainly kind of got that vibe for, you know, from it for what it's worth. Yeah. Yeah, it de de definitely did. Definitely did. And, you know, just shout out Fuchs playing with fire a little bit here. We'll see that kind of in the, the season two premiere when he gets sloppy without Barry. But, dude, when, like, Barry brings him to the airport and he's trying to kick him out and gives Fuchs, like, the bag of money, how the fuck does Fuchs get on the plane with that money? He doesn't have any false suitcase or anything like that. They kick him out right in front of a cop. Fuchs is fucked up. Like, when he gets out at the airport Terrible. in front of the cop with a bag of money and nothing happens. Like I and, almost and think it would have been the cooler person dropping him off. Yeah, I think it would have been cooler if like you turned off Fuchs was flipped at that point or something. You know, I'm just retroactively kind of saying that, you know, because again, this is the spoiler section. You can do shit like that. I definitely want to keep Steven Root on the show, but yeah, it's uh I am I'm so excited for it. I'm both rewatching season two and watching season four. One hundo, and that is a wrap on chapter eight. Know your truth. And just like that, we're on to season two, baby. Anything to add here, Mills, before we head out? I am just very excited that after having watched the season one finale, I don't have to wait like a year to watch the season two premiere. We can just kind of just jump into it. Shout out streaming 
time machines, the past, whatever. Just, yeah, dude. Uh, I think Barry's really hit its stride here. Very excited to keep talking about these. You know what you won't have to do is wait very long for another episode of the Barry Podcast, the legendary Barry Podcast. Thanks again for checking us out. Hopefully you enjoyed our show and we added something to your Barry experience, whether you're re-watching or checking out Barry for the very first time. Please remember to like, subscribe, comment, do it. If you haven't done it, go ahead, do it now. Mills, anything else before we bounce? Now, that is how you integrate the Predator reference there. You pretty much nailed it. Just remind the people that just, you know, wherever you pod, search for Barry Podcast, at Barry Podcast on the social needs, search for Barry Podcast on the YouTube. Also, you could just go to JoeBlowFootballShow.com, bring you right to our YouTube page, and that's pretty much it. Thanks again for checking us out. I'm Magna Mills. He's Jamie G. We are the co-presidents of the Mitch Fan Club, and we always like to go out by bringing it in. One, two, three, Cousineau!